Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action. This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the God's Authority presentation, Jesus analyzes the subject of love and authority, what God's authority is, what God has authority over, what humans have authority over, the results of accepting or rejecting God's authority, and answers audience questions on the subject. Recorded on the 11th of November 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Well, we have a bit of a change in pace now, guys. So we're going to talk about something most of us don't like very much. <laughs> Authority. <laughs> and uh, many of us even don't like our own because <laughs> we abdicate it frequently or attempt to. So we need, we need to talk a lot about this, uh, this subject. So in particular, we want to talk about God's authority, which is the subject of this discussion with you. Now, this was uh, something that I added to the program because I felt that the majority of people on earth neither respect nor understand God's authority. And, and there are all sorts of reasons for this, but obviously many of the reasons surround our current level of understanding of God and God's personality, nature and character. And so obviously that's going to severely affect our, our belief or our belief in or our acceptance of God's authority. So we want to discuss this subject. So first what we're going to do is introduce you to the concept of, or reintroduce you to the concept of the human law hangover. So remember, the human law hangover was basically those who had authority in our lives, teachers, but in particular parents or caregivers, teachers and other people like that, custodians, and lawmakers and enforcers as an adult. These people um, treat children a certain way, right? And as a result, children finish up growing up with this hangover about law. And that has a major influence on us as humans as to how we see authority. So the human law hangover, part of the human law hangover is this issue of our, our feelings, our current state of feelings towards authority, and also how we see authority in our future as well. So it also affects our desires, our desire in the end to come under God's authority or not. Now God, of course, uh, the fact that we all live and exist within God means that we are really all under God's authority in some way, right? It does not mean, however, that we can't create things that God has no part of. And in that way, it's a bit like a, you could say it's a bit like a bacteria living inside of a human. The bacteria can do things or have processes that involve things that live off the human, but that the human can either expel that condition or not. So that the, in other words, the human can either have control over that or desire or, or choose not to. Now, God's the same. God chooses to not take any responsibility for most of, or any of your creations, in fact. He chooses that. That's part of the gift of free will, him choosing to not take authority or responsibility over your creations. And we'll talk about that in, this, in the outline of this talk. So we want to examine how we see authority, how we view it, and how we respond to it. What, what do we do with it? How do we treat it? Those are the things we'd like to examine here. Now, of course, we need to firstly define authority. We need to see what we mean by authority. And basically, this is what we mean. It's the label given to the sum total of God's principles that all govern order. Right? So that's scope, hierarchy, governance, responsibility and compensation all working in unison with each other. Right? So here we have authority is the lay, it's just a label, a word given to the sum total of God's principles of scope, hierarchy, governance, responsibility and compensation working in unison that force assignment of authority 
to each soul that creates. Now, God being the great oversoul, obviously creates. Therefore, there's God, God keeps authority of certain things. But he gave you the gift of free will, so now you become a creator, and that means now you have authority over certain things, and God's gifted you this authority, and God will not take authority over certain things for you. He expects you to be a fully self-responsible being who has authority over its own creations. Does that make sense? Quite, quite simply. Each soul is the highest authority over its creations as long as all of the constituent parts of its creation have been created by the soul. Now, what I mean by this is, is what I mean by that is this. What do I mean by that is this? Okay. That's what I meant to say. So, so the soul, remember we're talking about the combined soul here because that's the soul, isn't it? Of which you're one half, so you, you, you obviously got a half of that effect going out of you. We're saying here that everything you create, so let's say you're a girl and you create some things, you know, Paintings, make up the house, yeah, create a house, babies, do you create babies? <laughs> babies, uh, I, I think you, many of you have a distorted view of that obviously, <laughs> they're gone, shoes, <laughs> clothes, <laughs> all right, shoes, Man, you're all pretty basic in your physical there, aren't you? So well, well, there's a whole aspect here we're missing. <laughs> anyway, we'll focus on the physical if that's where you want me to go. Okay. So anyway, we've created a whole heap of physical things there. Now, many of these things we have so-called created are not really our full creation, are they? So with painting, we had to get materials together. What laws govern the materials? God's. So God has authority over those materials. You can only utilise them. God has authority over He doesn't have authority over your final painting, because that's your creation, but he has authority over the constituent elements of your painting, because they are materials that he created. Right? So, so you do not have, you are not the highest authority over your painting. You're not. You, you believe you are, but you're not. Because the constituent elements of that painting were made by God, and so therefore God has a, quite a lot of authority over your painting. What happens to your painting, how it degrades, how it survives, how long it survives, will all depend upon the material properties of the constituent materials that God created in, that you used in your painting. Is that not true? So doesn't God have quite a lot of control over it? He does. You see? Okay, let's go down to babies. Mm. Do you have control over the soul of the baby? No, because God created that and only God created that. You didn't have any part in the soul creation of, of the baby's soul. So only God has authority over that. You don't have authority over it. So stop thinking you do because you don't. All right? Do you have any authority over the spirit body or the physical body of the baby? No, because all of the laws that went into the creation of that child actually happened through the commingling process of the sperm and the egg, and that was all controlled. God created all those processes too. So is a baby your creation in any sense? No, can't be on the list. Can you see? So you stop thinking it can. You don't have any authority over it. God has only given you a training role and an, an experiential role so that you can learn some things in that example. But you, with your painting, I agree, you do have some level of control. Of course, God did the most of it, so he has the most control over that too. 
how long it survives how it's going to survive, whether it survives heat, cold, whether it gets you know, inf interfered with by humidity and all those other things are all determined by God, they're not by you. Not at this stage anyway. If you do paintings the way they're normally done on the planet, that's how it's going to be, isn't it? Mm. So can you see that very few of these things you actually have full authority over? Can you see that? So start, start wondering, what do I really have full authority over? <laughs> it's like, how much, how much of these things do I really have full authority over? Because, because the reality is, while they are my creations, and I do have some authority over them, a lot of the constituent elements of those creations, God has authority over. And in, oftentimes, God is operating in complete disharmony with your operation with what you create. So as soon as you create a painting, God's trying to destroy it. Is that not true? Of course it's true. Yeah. Particularly on Earth, as soon as you create one, God's trying to destroy it. He's, because he's got laws that govern the degradation of matter. He's got law, and you're using dead matter. So what does this tell you about dead art? So-called art. Most of the people who do art on the planet are working with dead things and therefore the, the art itself is going to decay and die and eventually be destroyed. And isn't it? Of course. So can you really say from God's perspective it's art? What kind of art does God do? <laughs> living art. Living art. Everything's alive. Man, it's just amazing, isn't it? Living art. You have the capacity to do living art. You just don't think you do. So you don't. You use dead things to do the art. What, what do we do with the house? Same thing, isn't it? So, so whose authority governs what happens to this house now? Mostly it's going to be God's. And unless you're madly going around doing the opposite of what God's trying to do. So, so God's trying to destroy your house because it's all made of dead things. Is that not true? So, you know, it starts rusting, it starts decaying, white ants get into it, all the insects get into it. Everything's working to degrade or pull this back down so that it's usable with something living. At the moment, as a house, it's not usable with anything but yourself. And even then, it's questionable whether it's usable because most of our houses are not very well designed. So, you know, they're partly usable. But God's trying to destroy them. He's trying to get them back down to their original condition. That's what he's attempting to do, right? so that it can be reused, reused somehow by something else. So we there, we create another dead thing from dead matter, which results in decay and destruction in the long run. So it's not going to stay alive, is it? In the long run, it's going to decay, it's going to disappear. Long, long term, maybe if we build from stone or something, it might be a very long time, but at the end of the day, it is going to get destroyed. Now, if you want to have everlasting creations, then can you see straight away you've got to create in harmony with the life principle because that, that won't be destroyed anything that's alive god doesn't try to destroy he keeps it alive keeps it alive as long as life is possible he'll keep it alive anything that's not alive god straight away decays destroys and so forth so here we go we can see that we often view these as our creations can you see we're quite arrogant because most of it isn't our creations. Most of it is a mixture of, or a high mixture of God's creations and a little bit of our effort. And, and for, most, for the most part, we don't even understand what went into them. Most of us don't even know how a tree works. Right? So we have no understanding of when we cut down the tree and we use the wood in the house of what that did. No understanding at all. So... You know, it's debatable whether these are very big creations. And can you see that's why, in the long run, they get destroyed? <laughs> yeah. Can you also see that these are all physical in nature? And if we did spiritual creations, you can have paintings, you can have a house, you can have clothes, if you want. They are all spiritual creations, but they are still all physical in nature. Yeah. And then we've got the soul creations. Now we're starting to talk like 
long-term things, aren't we? Can you see? Many of you are trying to create here still, or here maybe, but not even there, mostly here, not realising that actually the soul creations have the highest potential to survive the longest period of time. Given the fact that if you receive some of God's love, you become an immortal being, doesn't that not mean that anything the soul that gets created from the soul from in the soul universe is going to be quite a long-standing thing? And it will only be destroyed if you destroy it. That's the only time it's going to be destroyed. But that's an illustration of this authority. We need to move on because there's a lot to learn here, right? So let's look at another definition. Love. God's definition of love includes each soul governing and having power over its own creation, being the highest point of hierarchy of its own creation, and having final responsibility for its own creation, and being compensated for the results of its own creation. Now, let's look at this. Physical creations. God, what that's basically saying is that you have, you, you, from God's perspective, you must have governance control over your painting. He gives you governance control over your painting. However, it's not absolute authority over your painting because God has governance control over all of its constituent elements. That make sense? But you do have control. You have a, you have authority over the painting. The fact that you created it, you made it like it is, you made it able to be destroyed. The fact that it's getting destroyed is actually your problem. Because you did it out of harmony with God's governance principles, of course it's going to get destroyed. But that's even your problem too. He, he sees those things as your creations, right? Same goes with the house. Same goes with clothes, shoes, whatever physical things here. Being the highest point of hierarchy over its own creation. So God's basically saying the highest point of hierarchy over your over paintings is not you. Because God created most of the constituent elements and therefore God has the highest input into your painting. Therefore, what happens to your painting will be determined by God's intentions. And God's intentions are, because it's dead, to destroy it. <laughs> so eventually it will be destroyed. Does that make sense? God's created it that way. Okay. Having the final responsibility for its own creation. Now, you are responsible for the painting, the, the amalgamation of all of the constituent element, elements that God created. You are responsible for the way in which the amalgamation occurred and the impact that the amalgamation of those constituent elements has upon the rest of creation. You're responsible for that. Because God did everything in his part in harmony with love. It's only your part that can be out of it. So God makes you responsible for that. But, but the final authority is still going to be God's in the sense that all of God's laws and all of God's other things are working towards a certain goal. Right? At the end of the day, working towards... But you are responsible for the house you built according to God. You're responsible for the fact that it's decaying because you didn't engage the building in harmony with God's other principles. And so it's decaying, and that's your problem. It's not God's white ants that are the problem. <laughs> they are working in harmony with God's laws. So when you go around spraying the white ants, now you're also responsible for that. Working out of harmony with the life principle, out of harmony with God, because God wants to destroy the thing that's dead, to turn it into matter for something that's living. We're even responsible for that. We've got to learn to create ourselves as humans. We've got to learn to create with more intelligence, don't we? Far more intelligence than we currently do. And we're compensated for the results of our own creation. So what effect did this painting have on people when they viewed it? One person went away and shot himself, <laughs> let's say, because it was so dark. The painting was so dark and it was a it, like... Maybe it was a painting of a demon or something and it just connected with him and, he, and then the spirits could connect to him as a result and all of a sudden he got really you know, overcoked by, that, by the spirit who, who wanted him to die and so he went off and shot himself. Now you're partially responsible for that. From God's perspective. Does that make sense? 
you're not fully, not very much responsible because obviously that's a lot to do with the person, but there is a part responsibility that's assigned through the law of compensation because of the effect it had on a person without your consideration. Yeah? Make sense? Tris, you'd like to ask? If we have Tris in here. That would be a little bit different than if you're creating weapons because your purpose is to hurt someone with those weapons. So there would be more compensation. Correct. So imagine what it's like for a scientist creating weapons of war. Whoa. You're now got huge compensatory effects because the, those weapons could kill, maim hundreds of thousands or millions of people, potentially, right? Whoa. That's pretty, that's pretty big responsibility, isn't it? Big compensatory effects there. Can you see how careful you've got to be with what you create? God attributes that. So love defines, God's definition of love says, this is what we're going to do. If we really love, we're going to govern having power over our own creation. We're going to be the highest point of hierarchy over our own creation. We're going to make sure we have responsibility for it. And we understand that we're going to be compensated for our actions, positively or negatively, of course. So there we go. We're now in this state where we understand a bit more about love and we understand a bit more about authority. So let's now start looking at understanding God's authority. What is the scope of God's authority? Well, how big is God's authority? Well, this is, it. this is it. God is the great oversoul, which we've learnt already, right? The infinite oversoul, yes? And has immutable authority over all of God's principles, all of God's laws, and all of God's creations. Anything down from the, from the smallest particle, remember that potentially is infinitesimally small, right the way through to even God's personality and nature, which is the highest of all of God's creations, if you think of it that way, is all under the control of God and God has authority over them. And even over the potential laws and creation formed through the governing principles. So anything that might in the future be created by the laws commingling. Remember, we talked about that in the way scope works. Scope allows commingling of laws and therefore the commingling of creations to create new, more complicated creations. And God even has authority over the things that have yet to be created. That's how serious God views authority. He even takes authority over the things that were possible to be created through the law. And whether we recognise that or not, that's God's the scope of God's authority. So that's a pretty powerful authority, isn't it? Yeah, sort of not much that's missed out there, is there? There are a few things missed out, but not much. Yeah. Okay, so what do we learn about that? That God has authority over human creations that contain elements that God created. So here we see the examples, right? Painting has elements God created. So God has authority over those elements. So if you use a wooden frame that has certain properties, has certain things, and it's dead wood as well, so it's not living, so it's going to be attacked by the environment that God created to attack anything dead so that it could deconstruct it to provide food for the life principle. So, so the painting is going to get destroyed sooner or later. God has authority over that. But God doesn't have authority over the painting itself and the fact that you created it. God, anything that you did on it, the impact that it has on other people because of the commingling of the way you put together all of those elements, that's your responsibility. That's where you have authority over. Do you follow? If we keep going here, you'll sort of get the flavour of the whole thing as we go. So, children. God created their soul and the laws governing their bodies. So whose are they? God's, not yours. Yep, very simple. Elements of creation by humans that needed elements God created. We've seen examples here. These all needed elements God created, so therefore God has the ultimate authority over them. Eventually, whatever God wanted to have happen with those things are going to happen. It's inevitable. 
Yeah? God does not have direct authority over human creations that do not contain elements that God created. Now, it's very interesting to try to work out what those might be because when you think about it, almost anything physical that you can create, God has some level of authority or control over, doesn't he? Because he created the constituent elements that actually created it. So therefore, he has authority over almost all of our creations in some way. right? No, but, he, but, but when we say he has authority, he cannot be blamed, nor can he be attributed or, or nor can blame be attributed to God for the things that we decided to do with those constituent elements. The principle being that it, I can create a knife and it has a purpose to cut things up. But if you use it to destroy life, like cutting up a human, stabbing a human, you are now out of harmony with God's principles of that thing's creation. You are responsible for your choice to use it badly. You see? Same applies here. You can create a painting that has deep impacts on people that can actually cause them to do evil things. You can. Is that not what video oftentimes is? Paintings streamed one after the other into a moving picture that can greatly influence is that not what video games often are? Paintings, art, developed into a certain way that has an influence on people's lives. Even if it just influences them to sit down and do nothing for eight hours a day, that is a negative influence from God's perspective. And there will be compensatory effects for that. Does that make sense to you? So you can see... hmm. I need to maybe take a bit more responsibility for my creations, right? So God does have authority over the principles and laws that govern the effects of such creation. So here, I create the painting. The creating, the my part of the painting was my inspiration or aspiration to make it really dark and evil and as bad as I could make it. Let's say that's my part of the inspiration. Now, God does have control over the laws that governed my inspiration. But he doesn't have control over how I used that inspiration, what I did to it, what I did to make the picture. So in other words, he is trying to remove from my soul anything that is an unloving inspiration, an unloving aspiration coming from my soul he's trying to remove. So he has control over the laws that govern that, but he doesn't have control over my aspiration. I have control over that. Does that make sense to you? So there are things here that we start to see that I have control over, God has control over. Interesting. So what about our authority now? So we've seen God's authority, what he has control over and what he doesn't have control over and what he's not going to take responsibility for because that is your responsibility. So we've seen the difference. We can see that many of our creations, God has ultimate authority over because he created most of the constituent elements and what happens to the thing in the long term is going to be very dependent upon what God's creations are going to do in the long term. But in the shorter term, and why I say in the shorter term, usually in a lifetime or a few lifetimes or 20 lifetimes it might be if we really create something that lasts a longer time and people preserve it, that can have effect on lots of different people. Now, does it have a positive effect on them or a negative effect on them? Well, if it has a negative effect on them, then partly, you can see, I, because I created the image, not, not the materials that used that created the image, but the image itself, I'm going to bear responsibility for what that image does to people. Okay, so let's look at the scope of our authority. So we've already seen that God does not have direct authority over human creations that do not contain elements God created. Right? But God does have authority over the principle and laws that govern such creations. So let's say I can create, and we'll look at in a minute how we can, but let's say I can create something that, n that doesn't use any of the elements that God's created. 
let's say that's possible for a moment. Right? So I, I go ahead and create it. It doesn't use any of the elements. It, it can use the laws, though, but not the elements of the creation itself. If I go ahead and do that, then I have direct and complete authority over that creation. Nobody else does. But God still has authority over the laws and principles, even though I've done that. And we'll see some examples of this. Humans have direct authority over human creations that do not contain elements God created. So let's look at this. Examples. Sin. Humans have control, direct authority over sin, with one or two exceptions. Sin creates emotions that flow within the soul. And God has direct authority how, how the emotions flow. So the sinful emotions you have, God has control over how they flow in the soul and how they affect other people. Right? But the sin itself that you created, you have control over, and God will not destroy it, even if you have control over it. However, God is attempting to destroy it through the principles and laws that God has governing the way emotions flow through the soul. Can you see the difference? So here we have uh, an aspect of something we can create that God will not destroy, but he's attempting to. Because the laws are all governed to help it be destroyed. It's just whether you use your will, continue to use your will out of harmony with love or truth, determines whether it is destroyed or not. But you've got to work in harmony with the law in order for it to be destroyed. Does that make sense? But it is still your creation. So God's not going to take authority over it. He's not going to destroy it for you without your permission or without your desire, is he? You can, however, ask God to help you, and he will help you destroy it. But he's not going to do it without your participation, because it's your creation. Right? Another example. A child sin. Interesting. Particularly a child is very, very, very young, has little or no developed will yet. And therefore, he's, or when I say developed will, developed desire. So he only has his will, which is acceptance from his environment. And where did that environment come from? Well, a large part of it came from you, the parent. As a result, a child's sin will be attributed mostly to you. You're responsible for what your child chooses to do out of harmony with love because you placed within them a condition that cause them to make those particular choices. <laughs> Not many parents like that one. Disease in the body. Disease in the body is a direct creation of the human using his soul-based desire and also his current will to suppress an emotional element inside of the soul that's out of harmony with love that then causes a disease in the body. So the disease in the body is the direct creation of the human. God will not remove the disease in your body unless he has your cooperation and your desire to do it. Now, how can you say, see, most of us say we have a desire to, for God to remove, say, cancer, while at the same time engaging the addiction that creates the cancer. That's not a desire. That's not sincere, you see. It has to be a sincere desire then God can assist in the removal. Until that time, you have direct authority over the disease. Same applies to sickness, accidents and so forth, right? My soul-based spiritual condition. Except any substance that exists within the soul that is from God received by choice. What does that mean? Well, my soul-based spiritual condition is Depend, determined by the exercise, previous exercise of desire, which creates my current will, my current condition. My current condition or my current will is now a certain spiritual condition. I or other humans who, who shared in my uh, experiential existence have created this condition. 
God doesn't have any control over that. You who do. Except the only control God has is any substance, like God's love, that you may have chosen to receive in the past that is now within you. God has control over that. Can you see, to receive God's love, you must also begin to accept God's authority. Interesting. Interesting that God designed it that way, huh? That actually God has authority over that love. Therefore, God controls its constituent elements, even though it might exist within you. Interesting. Got to think about that for a while as to the effects of that, huh? So let's look at some more examples. My emotions out of harmony with God's principles. Any emotion I have that's out of harmony with God's principles is, is sin, is it not? Any one of those emotions, therefore, God is not going to erase from my soul. I have direct control over my emotions. God only has control over the laws that govern them. The laws that allow them to flow in a certain way and how they flow and all those kind of things. God controlled that by having laws that govern the operation of your emotions. But the reality is the actual emotion itself is your creation. Therefore, under your control. Or it might have been the creation of your mum and dad in your childhood. Then it's under their control and your control. Now that you're an adult, it's definitely under your control. My creation is out of harmony with God's principles, such as creations that pollute and damage life. So, so let's put in here um, a vehicle. Now, a vehicle could be in harmony with God's creations or out of harmony with God's creations. Okay. Now, what are the most serious things to get in harmony with God's creations? Here's the soul, here's the spiritual. In other words, the metaphysical, and here's the physical. What do you think are going to be the most severe disharmonies? Given the power of each thing, isn't it these? Right. So what I see happening for many of you is this. You're so worried about getting your house right in, the way, in harmony with God and getting your clothes right in harmony with God and getting your vehicle right in harmony with God and, and getting everything in harmony with God except for these things. <laughs> and these things are going to have the most detrimental effect and the most powerful effect on how you're dealt with by God's laws. Can you see the stupidity of it really? We, 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 should, we should not worry about the fact that you painted, you painted something that was out of dead material. Who gives, who gives the stuff at this point? You know it's going to get destroyed anyway in the long term. What matters is the soul-based motivation that caused you to make this painting to be a series of images that caused the destruction of a person's soul. That matters more. Do you see? What matters is... This soul-based unloving attitude that needs to be corrected. This is where we need to put our first effort, not our last effort. So when some of you ask me questions about, oh, the, you know, the even right down to the veganism thing and the eating what you eat and what you drink and what you wear and what, you know, how you live your life and whether you're going to do this or that in your life and how unloving is this and how unloving is that. I'm going, man, what about your addiction to ask me? <laughs> That, that's worse than all of those things put together. <laughs> Can you see you don't see the priority? Because we're so, we're so thinking that the physical matters and we forget that what matters to God is the soul, the heart-based condition. So, so yes, in the end, we will sort out these things in our life. But can you see it is the... It is the soul that needs to be sorted out first. And, and yet most of you are asking questions sorting out this first. And when I ask you for a list of your creations, what do you list? You list these. And, and what, what should have you listed? Anger, addiction, sin, fear, control, judgment. 
Can you see? Now, this is where we don't understand, you see? We don't understand. We, 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 we're thinking that they don't matter. We don't even think of them as creations, do we? Don't even consider them as creations. And these things, what do we do? We go, there's our creations, there's our creations, there's our creations. And the irony is, God's got control of most of these creations. They're going to get destroyed at some point. Does God have control of these? No. How are they going to get destroyed? By us having to do something, right? Some, some desire has to be exercised to destroy them, otherwise they're going to remain. Can you see the, the issue? Our priorities are way out of whack, right? Aren't they? They're way out of whack. We, we, we're, we're believing these are our creations and these matter and they don't really matter. God's already destroying them at the moment we're doing them. <laughs> you know, the, we're, we're doing them and God's got things trying to destroy them already, laws that govern the destruction of them. They're already being destroyed. They're being handled naturally because God has authority over them. And what he wants to have happen to them is going to happen. But God does not have authority over these things. You do. He only has authority over the laws that govern how they flow through you. He doesn't control what they are, where they come from. He, doesn't, he didn't do any of those things. Only you have control over that. Can you see? So now we're starting to understand, oh, this authority issue, right? It's pretty important, isn't it? It's a pretty important principle in our life. So let's uh, examine some of the things. So it says, God has no authority over the human use of will, but does have authority over its effects upon the soul and the environment because he created the laws that govern that. So he doesn't control your will. He doesn't control what you choose to do, what you're currently doing, your desire, either what you want to do in the future. He doesn't control all of those things, but he does have control over the laws that govern how they affect you. Isn't that wonderful? Because if he didn't have control over that, who knows how that affect us? <laughs> and it would be hit and miss and unpredictable and it would be very difficult to actually to get rid of them. So God has... Only authority over the laws that govern the soul, not the soul itself. So what does God expect? Well, God expects humans to destroy their own creations that are out of harmony with God's principles. So these creations, we list them, they're out of harmony with God's principles. God expects the person who created them to do something about it. Isn't that fair? Of course it's fair. It's just God's already doing something about this because a large part of the constituents of the creation are God's anyway. So God can look after these quite easily, but he can't look after these, can he? Not for you. Something you're going to have to do yourself. So, what, so what's the end result? The end result is well, we've got some decisions to make. <laughs> can you see? We've got some decisions to make. And can you see that the primary decisions relate to the spiritual or you could say the love-based condition of the soul? That's our primary decisions, isn't it? Because that this is a list of things that we have created that have no constituent elements that God created. God only has laws that govern the flow of them, but God didn't create them. Something else or someone else did. So what are our choices? Two choices, really. We accept God's authority or we reject it. Is that not true? Right? And, and, and staying on the fence is rejecting it. Is that not also true? Yes. So we, let's look at accepting. What would it do? What would it look like? A person who emotionally accepts God's authority automatically loves, respects and accepts God's personality, attributes, character, principles, laws and creations and is more open to desiring God's love. That's a person who accepts God's authority. There's a pretty long list there of what you need to accept if you're going to accept God's authority. Can you see that if you don't accept even God's personality, 
It's like mo- on the planet, we have this viewpoint of God's personality that God's a punishing, wrathful God. Basically, that's the underlying. That's not accepting God's personality. So automatically having that, having that view is not accepting God's authority. Just by having that feeling, we're not accepting God's authority. What about rejecting God's authority? It's not possible, really, is it? As a real condition. Because he has authority. He's the infinite being in the universe. Do you think what you want to do really in the end is going to in the long run affect him very much at all? In the long run? But it does affect him because it's happening inside of him. But in the long run, do you think it's going to affect him? Probably not, right? He's probably given all the laws and given all his authority and given what he has authority over. In the long run, you'll change. It's just how resistive you are in between time. How much pain you want to go through before then. It's the choice to believe, feel and act as if God's authority does not exist. That's what rejecting God's authority really is. The choice to believe, feel and act as if it doesn't exist. It's not that God's authority doesn't exist, because it always does. It's your choice to believe and act as if it doesn't. And can you see we do that a lot, right? Even in this list, you were doing it. You say, I say, what are your creations? You go, paintings, house, physical, baby even was in there, right? Interestingly enough, babies was there, right? And babies are not even anything that you created. Like, there's not even on the list that you believed it was. That's your imagination, you see? But, but the things that you did have a part in creating, like shoes, clothes, vehicle, and all those physical things, can you see... We chose to feel like they were our creations. But that's not realistic. All the constituent elements of those creations all came from God. How can we call them our creations? We could say, yeah, I I dreamed up something and then I got God's thing of this and God's thing of that and God's this and God's that and God's this and God's that and all of the God's things I decided to put together in this way and that's the creation. So who can take the main credit for it? Well, no, that's, that, that's not it, eh? That's not how we see it. We say, oh, I'm the person that should take credit for that. Don't we? It's, fun, it's so funny. We're trying to take credit for the things that are mostly God's. And the things that are mostly ours, or all ours, what do we do? <laughs> not me. Not me. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Somebody else did that. Mummy did that. Daddy did that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not responsible for that. That's in me, but I'm not responsible. I've got control of my soul. Maybe I haven't. Oh, no. Maybe I haven't. God created a flawed soul. Yeah, that's all God's fault too. That's God's fault. That's God's fault. Isn't that what we do? That's our problem. Because we're not seeing the reality. The reality is these creations are ours and the reality also is that god's not going to take authority over them he's not going to destroy them for us he's not going to send the savior to get rid of them for us either he's not we're going to have to engage a process to get rid of them now god's willing to help you get rid of them but he's not going to get rid of them for you alan So when we create a service for humanity, um, is that a co-creation and what is getting supported and destroyed in that sort of... Well, you can see that basically, Alan, rather than answering each individual question of what is and what isn't, you can see that we're going to have to spend a lot more time in contemplation, are we not, when we create. We need to say, okay, yeah, I'm using this element of God's here and this element of God's here. What does God want to do with that element? What is he doing with that element? Is that the wise element to use under these circumstances, given the fact that I want something to last longer than that or whatever? Yeah, I suppose desire comes back to it as well. What's our intention? True, True, it does. But can you also see that emotions last longer than physical creations? 
because emotions are creations of the soul, which is a more powerful entity than anything that's created in the physical. So they, the effect of these is going to be much longer than the effect of these. So you, you, know, you worry about the physical thing being in harmony with God's love and not worried about this being in harmony with God's love, you're really doing things back to front. Ask about, as we say in Australia, you know, isn't it? We're basically trying to suggest that, that this will be not worth worrying about and this is the thing that we need to concern ourselves with and the complete opposite is the case. Complete opposite. So really, rejecting God's authority is a choice to reject God's personality, attributes and character. So whenever you think that God is not good, you've rejected God's authority. Interesting. What other choices? We can't establish a relationship. We've got to receive God's love if we reject God's authority. Obviously. Isn't it obvious? If you're rejecting God's authority, how can you receive a part of God? God's authority governs God's love. How can you receive a part of God without accepting God's authority? You can't. Right? Interesting concept, right? But true. Will automatically, rejecting God's authority will automatically create unhappiness, not only for myself, but also for others, obviously. You're rejecting the very person who created all the principles. Surely, God must have something to say about that in the principles themselves. As a part of those principles, there must be this aspect of God's authority built into them. Right? Isn't that what you would do if you created something? Of course you would. You would make some lists of rules of what, how to use it and what to do. And the fact that you're the manufacturer, it comes back to you if it's faulty, right? God's done the same thing with all of God's laws and principles. God's, this means, of course, that if, when we're out of harmony with God's personality or nature, automatically, out of harmony with God's authority, automatically we're creating unhappiness too. Huh? Interesting concepts, right? And it's really a part of my sin against the Holy Spirit. Remember, the biggest, most serious sin that this soul can commit is the sin against the Holy Spirit. The reason why it's the biggest is because while you're sinning against the Holy Spirit, you cannot receive God's love. And as a result of that, all of the wonderful potentials you'll learn about tomorrow will not be open to you. Therefore, it's your biggest sin. It, it's stopping you from the most amount of joy you could ever experience. Does that make sense? So it is the biggest sin from God's perspective. So it, it, rejecting God do you, do you think that we can reject God while at the same time, or reject God's authority while at the same time getting love from God? Of course not. That's impossible. Yeah. Interesting, hey? Now, I'm well and truly over time, aren't I? <clears throat> I am. So what I'm going to do is incorporate the question and answer in this discussion now. And the reality is that I've only got a very few questions anyway to, to discuss, but Mary has one from... I have got a theories from spirits. I don't know if you want to view them before yes, I ask them. Um, let's, uh, let's ask some of the ones from spirits in this discussion. So basically we're, having, we're going to... Are you OK to skip the Q&A? You're right to... Yeah. We, we'll do that? Everyone's all right with that? I'm asking Lena if she's all right she with that because she's the one who's tag. tagging for us as well. We'll just incorporate this in the edit as no Q&A and just a part of the discussion. All right? Far away. Okay. So it's four related questions. Sure. So the first part is, are, there's a list. Are the following things my creations? Relationships. Yes. My partner, children, other associates while still on earth. I know I'm still in relationship with these people, even though I'm in the spirit world. Yes. Family dynamics, the way my family members currently relate to each other. No. It depends on, it depends on there's many parts of that creation. Some of it's society, some of it's family members in history, some of it's the sins of family members in history, some of it is your own. So there's parts of it that are, but not completely. Right. Because there's a feeling that they've influenced those dynamics very strongly. Well, of course, the influence they've placed on those dynamics that have been out of harmony with love certainly is part of their own creation. Okay. 
Religious belief systems or other belief systems that I supported or promoted while on earth? Um, yes, you promoted the um, continuation of those belief systems. So you will pay, you know, there is a part to play in that. But you weren't necessarily the creator of those belief systems. And so the creators of those belief systems have a much larger um, part to play with regard to the authority over those things. The way my family members currently abuse substances? Um, well, again, it de that depends very much upon your level of oppression over those family members and your level of influence over those family members. So, yes, if you have either attempted to oppress them, which causes a rebellious anger towards oppression, which then causes people to sort of be attracted to substances, or if you, you know, through your different treatment of them, cause them to desire such substances, or you desired such substances and therefore influenced their desire of such substances, then yes, you have, that is partly your creation. Okay, and the, the last item you've answered, physical items. So then the, the three follow-up questions to that. Um, Fire. Am I responsible to destroy these things? How can I do this from where I am now? Because they still exist on earth. Yes. And won't God's laws and love destroy these things for me? Won't God take care of my family and ensure their happiness? Well, it's a ver these are very good questions, right? Because the reality is that, yes, God's laws are attempting to destroy anything that we have created that's out of harmony with God's laws. That is true. However... There's a method or a mechanism by which these things are destroyed. And if the destruction of these things would involve God overcoming our will or our desire in any way, then God can't do it. We have to do it. You want to? They want to say? Yeah, they want to say then. So my will was involved in all of those things Correct. that I listed. Yes. But now I'm not there. Huh. How do I remove that from my family? Ah, this is the mechanism of repentance. You see, there's a mechanism, there's mechanisms that God has provided for things that we created, which we now see that we have very little control over. There's a mechanism that God has provided to allow us to begin destroying these things. And repentance is a part of that mechanism. So there's a, there are scientific mechanisms that God has provided to help us destroy things that we no longer have physical control over. But that's a, another very complicated discussion, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, Felix, just straight behind Mary. You had a question. Was it, was it the genetic engineering one? No, it's, um, are you saying that... Um, oh, oh, that one. Yes. So, oh, oh. so basically, um, <clears throat> my feeling to reject God's authority and anything like that is one of the most important things to work on, um, as important as, say, the faith, emotion, truth, uh, action thing in the first group. It is. Okay. You're dead right. It is. So it have the most um, beneficial effects and most... Uh, it's like a shortcut even. Yes, in a lot of ways it is. If you address the emotional reasons why you have a tendency to reject God's authority, you will deal with many blockages towards God as a result. And as a result of dealing with blockages towards God, that will open your heart quite rapidly to accepting God's authority. And we have many, many reasons why we want to reject God's authority, but they're all emotional injuries that have the most powerful negative influence over our life because while we reject God's authority, we can't accept God's love. So obviously it's going to have a large impact on us if we can do that. Okay. Um, can I ask a question about that? Or sure. do you want to move on? Sure, okay. you can. Um, in the very, first, the very start of the first assistance group, you talked about... Um, how we project, you know, what our, our experience with our parents onto God. Yes, we do. Is this what you're really talking about here? 
Exactly. Yeah. You okay. can see how a lot of this is linked, right? Yeah. What we're doing, what we're actually doing is blaming God for what we don't want to blame our parents for. That's really what we're doing. And, and the pro problem with that is we want to still get... See, it's very interesting to look at the analysis of that because here we have a parent, right? Here we have us, let's say we're still the child and oftentimes in our own head we're often smaller than our parent even when we're an adult. What we're doing is we don't want to blame our parent for what they've actually done because our parent may no longer love us, right? Isn't that true? That's why we do it. We, we still want our parent at some point in the future to love us. Is that not true? And so we blame our parent and that, that then means we, uh, we don't blame our parent when we should, but we don't blame our parent and that leaves our heart open to keep waiting for love from them, doesn't it? Do you see that? It actually has the effect of opening our heart to them, waiting for them to love us. That's, that's, what we, that's, it's, that's the reason why we don't blame our parents for what they've done. Because our heart wants to stay open to them eventually loving us at some point. You follow me? The irony is, here's God who is capable of loving us and wants to love us. And instead, we put this blame on God. Now, when we blame someone, we close our heart to them. So can you see what we're doing? We're closing our heart to the very person who can love us and leaving our heart open to the very person who hurt us at the same time. How can you see? It's like, oh, wow, well, that's a pretty amazing thought when you think about it. We're blaming God for things that our parents did so that we don't have to blame our parents. And why do we want that? It's because we still want love from our parents, but we don't care about whether we get love from God or not. So we blame God instead. We don't care about whether we receive love from God. So what we do is we blame God because it doesn't matter to us that we're not receiving love from God. The irony is... Receiving love from God is the very thing that will transform your life, totally change it, totally influence your rest of your life in a positive manner. And we're blaming the very person who can give us the most benefit while at the same time staying open to probably the very person who caused the most problems. <sighs> oh. You can uh, ask. Uh, so you're saying that then that um, part... A big part of that is is both recognizing that my parent didn't didn't love me in whatever situations, but also, um, f like, emotionally uh, deciding finally that I I don't need I I to give up love from getting acceptance from dad or stuff. Yeah, can you see if I have to give up receiving love from my earthly father or earthly mother, I'll probably have to go through a fair bit of grief, right? Yeah, that I don't want to feel. So, so you can see the problem with not giving it up is that I blame God for it now. I'm pushing all that onto God. And now I can't receive love from the person who wants to give it. So I'm setting myself up to have no satisfaction of my desire for love from anybody. Actually, that's what I'm doing. And, and do people sometimes blame someone else other than God, like just blame society? Or, of course, yeah, blame like society kind of society or okay. someone who... And quite often they'll blame the parent who loves them even. Mm, okay. <laughs> they'll even do that in order to get love from the parent who doesn't. Yeah. Uh, we do all sorts of strange things, leaving our heart open to the very person who caused the damage while at the same time closing down our heart towards the very people who could help us grow and change and also feel loved and... It's such a sad thing, really, when you think about it, isn't it? Thank you. Now, a lot of that's happening because we're, we're basically saying God's responsible for all of what our parents did. That's really what we're saying, isn't it? We're saying, oh, God, God, and God isn't responsible because God does not have authority over how the parents use their soul. God's not responsible for that. God's only responsible for the laws that govern the soul, not how the parents use them. And, and so we're actually continuing to blame God for something that really doesn't even belong to God, it belongs to something else. And we do it, and, and the trouble is we re our heart remains open to the very persons who harmed us, while at the same time our heart remains closed to the very person who can help us. Very sad state really, isn't it? Can you see the importance of 
recognizing it like see there's a lot there's a lot involved in this discussion obviously again this is another discussion that we're just sort of scratching the sur barely scratching the surface of right but you can see the problems that arise we can see firstly as you as we can see and maybe I need to bring it to conclusion because we're over time now but but we can see that we we're, we're placing importance on the very things that God will assist us to destroy already because of God's laws allowing that and we're placing no importance on the very things God has to wait for us to decide what to do before any help can be given and then on top of that we blame God for the very things that our parents have done and we leave our heart open to the parents and we don't leave our heart open to God and, and, the, and then we wonder why we're not feeling loved just because our hearts are closed towards the very person who can supply that love. Because we want to remain open to the other people who didn't. And we're not prepared to emotionally grieve the loss of a parent who loves us, really. We're not prepared to just grieve that and let it go. And then we could accept the real parent and accept how that real parent feels about us. The feelings that come from God are overwhelmingly beautiful when you let yourself feel them. Right? But the majority of us do not let ourselves feel them. We don't. Because we want to remain open to getting love to the very people, getting love from the very people who did not love us. We, in other words, we are basically remaining open to our parents having authority over us. So this is the irony. We're rebelling against God's authority thinking we're some kind of independent being. But the reality is we're giving away authority to the very people who misused it. I can't answer any more questions, Felix. Does that make sense to you? Can you see the problems? So can you see the choices we're making? Are very, uh, like they're, they're really quite insidious in some ways, aren't they? In terms of stopping our development, stopping our growth, and, and badly influencing where we place our priorities and therefore where our desire lay. Right? You can see that if we understood completely what we were creating and we would be going, look, fair enough, all of these things are physical. What I do physically doesn't really matter as much as what I do spiritually or what I do with love. What I do with love matters the most. Right? These are the permanent creations, positively and negatively, by the way. We could put in here a whole heap of positive things. So every single act of goodness that you engage is adds to your soul and it's there permanently because God doesn't want to destroy that. So you can actually do an act of goodness today and in a thousand years' time, people will still be benefiting on the earth from it. Because God doesn't want to destroy that. God's, all God's laws support the existence of that act of goodness. Do you see that? So... so Here's all the things that are out of harmony, love, and God wants to, God wants to get, get rid of them. He's created a whole heap of laws to get rid of them, but you have to engage those laws to get rid of them. But God also has allowed you to create good things in this column, the, under the soul. Things that where you act in harmony with love, act in harmony with pure desire, act in harmony with truth. Every act taken in that place will last forever. Literally. It'll last as long as your soul lasts. And if you receive some of God's love, you're immortal. That means you last forever. So that means that every act that you took in harmony with love will last forever. The effects of it will be felt forever. Now, that's a remarkable thing to think about. Instead of worrying about a painting, you know, they just like, blah, 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 ding, 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 and God destroys it in, a year, in, a, in a 10 years or 100 years' time. How about painting something in the soul and, and having it last forever? How about you become that kind of artist? That would be great, wouldn't it? And this is where we need to see our priorities and how God's authority is acting upon the system. Mm. So hopefully this discussion has expanded your mind a bit with regard to things, right? So when you first looked at the discussion in, the, in your outline, you probably thought, 
oh, authority, why did he put that in there for? What's going on there? And now hopefully you can see the importance of it and also how it affects your creations and what it means about what you create and what things will be naturally destroyed, things that you don't have to worry about as much if they're in or out of harmony with love, when compared with things that you do need to concern yourself quite seriously about because these are creations that either last forever or and, and, and even if they're bad creations, they will last until you destroy them, until you decide to do something about them. Now, there are mechanisms by which God has to help you destroy them, which is fortunate given the fact that many of these creations have ongoing effects into other lives and other people's existences that without God's help, we would never be able to get raise the result. So it's very fortunate that God has allowed these laws and you'll learn some of them tomorrow. But it's very fortunate God has done that because if God didn't do that, imagine trying to destroy. Imagine you create a religion, you know, like the Muslim faith. You create the Muslim faith 600 or whatever happened, 400. I can't remember the exact year that Muhammad, 600 something. What was it? Five, 620 or something, yeah. I forget exact, but... But anyway, so you create the Muslim faith. It's got a whole lot of tenets that also seems to justify violence under certain conditions. By the way, a lot of what's in the Bible does exactly the same thing. So the Torah could be fit into this exact the same, exact same thing. Like so, Moses, who actually assisted through spirit inspiration the creation of the Torah, which also has exactly the same principles that many of the Muslim principles contain. Right? Both those people that imagine. Years later, people are still acting in harmony with eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Imagine how many people have died acting in harmony with these, law, these principles. Right? Now, you're now in the spirit world. How are you going to correct all that? You can't. Unless you engage something that God has authority over, which is some of God's principles we'll learn tomorrow, you will not be able to, to negate the effect of what you created. It'd be a disaster. Your soul would be remain in condition, terrible condition for long periods of time unless there was some process that you could engage that reverses this. Right? And this is why it's so important to see, firstly, don't create what you can't destroy is a good principle to remember, isn't it? Don't create what is so difficult to destroy that takes years and years to destroy. And remember, everything in your soul that's out of harmony love takes a lot longer to destroy than these things because they have effects on other people that then might take years and years and years to destroy. Friends of mine 2,000 years ago involved in certain behaviour and there's still people in the hills today that have, are acting the way they're acting because of the effects of what those friends decided to do. Now, if God did not have the mechanisms we learn tomorrow, that would be those people who are my friends would still be in the hells today. So fortunately, God's created some mechanisms for us to undo these things, but we need to understand this is what we have authority over. And God cannot help us with them unless we want that assistance. Okay, so we'll leave our discussion there. Hopefully you've learnt something from that one. Yep. Or could we say that you've probably learnt something from every discussion? Is that possible? <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, so tomorrow we will have a discussion about those principles, the ones that help us to deal with this, deal with this creation of ours that we have authority over. And then we'll look at the transformation principles, which are just wonderful principles to discuss with you. Very powerful, the most powerful principles in the universe and just wonderful to be able to have some of those discussions with you tomorrow. Hopefully you've enjoyed yourself today and uh, we'll see you bright and... Well, it's not bright and early, is it? It's after a nice relaxing morning, <laughs> swim here and whatever there, at 11 o'clock um, tomorrow and we'll get started on our last day of our presentations, which also happen to be, for your soul, the most important day. Can you see? Anyway, we'll leave it there. Thanks for your time today, guys, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>